Good afternoon, my name's Corey Wilson. Um, welcome to Broadcasting Scotland's special Scottish Budget Report. Okay, I'm joined this afternoon by George Caravan. Welcome, George. Um, so today we're, we're going to look at the um, Scottish Budget and we'll, we'll go over to the Parliament for that announcement. Um, but obviously before that, there's going to be a Brexit statement from the Minister and we'll go over and look at that too. So we'll probably just have a chat about Brexit first. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't know where to start, to be honest, George. What, what do you think of this chaos in Westminster? First of all, can I say thank you for inviting me on. It's my first yeah. time on Broadcasting Scotland. Really, really excited. You run out of words to describe what's going on, because every day in Westminster is another catastrophe, another, another explosion. But I think the decision of the ERG group to go for May's jugular, to really open up the contest for the leadership, even though I think they'll lose, it shows that they don't care any longer. They are going to fight tooth and nail to destroy her Brexit compromise. So it doesn't matter whether she comes back from, from Ireland, if she goes there tomorrow, wherever she's going, she's going to Europe tomorrow. It doesn't matter where she comes back with any kind of new deal, they're going to vote it down. So all, all that's happening is we're prolonging the agony. Yeah. And obviously there, there's the announcement today that there's going to be a vote of no confidence in our party, um, or from our party tonight. What do you think the outcome? Is she going to survive that, do you think? I think she'll survive. Now, you, you can never tell because it's a secret ballot. And there are lots of people saying, oh, we'll support the Prime Minister. I mean, you know, when you get into the... Into the um, the voting booth, will, you know, oh, their fingers will, will shake. And there are some people who are going to hear they'll probably be bought off with offers of a peerage, peer, a peerage and so on. So we don't know. But I, I would guess that she will get through. Um, because if there were enough votes to get rid of her, they would have put the letters in calling for, for, for a leadership election already. Mm -hmm. um, so I think she'll scrape by. And she's a bit pig-headed, I think, so she'll just go on and on and on. But nevertheless, the very fact that the Tory party is split so publicly means that the, 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 her, the death knell is already sounded. Mm. And as I say, all that's going to happen is we're, we're, we're delaying the, the vote uh, on the Brexit deal. That will get voted down by Parliament and then we're in uncharted waters. And obviously she was um, in Europe yesterday and, and did a bit of a whistle stop to her, but she appears to have been sent home with a tail between her legs. I mean, we haven't had a lot of detail about what was discussed, but Certainly from, from the EU side of things, they are saying they're not budging on what they've already agreed. Absolutely. Now, she went there saying, can you do something about the backstop for Ireland? No, that's the one thing they're not going to give ground on. Um, so it was a bit, it was a bit of theatre. I mean, she, yeah. she needed an excuse to delay the vote. So let's go and talk to the Europeans again. Nothing was going to happen. Do you think um, the, the, you know, the next big question has to be about Jeremy Corbyn and how he's handling this? You would have thought this would have been an ideal opportunity for him to have sprung forward with some leadership and, and taken the government down, but he, he doesn't seem to be willing to do that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you and I were in Parliament together and I got to know uh, Jeremy quite well. I mean, in the early days, just after the 2015 election, you know, um, before he took over the Labour leadership, he, would, you know, he was regularly in the voting lobbies with, with the SNP. So you got to chat with him. But he's not really leadership material in my view. He's, uh, he's a very nice man, and you can agree or disagree with his politics. Generally, he's on the left. He's generally, generally, his politics are very sound, but from my point of view. But he's not, you know, he's not a get out and go. He's not going you know, to move the troops, organise things. The real leader of, of the Labour Party in Parliament at the moment is John McDonnell. And I think he would have, he would have been much more, uh, uh, you know, going for the, mm. so the, the jugular with me. So I think, I think uh, yesterday and today, Corb uh, PMQs, I don't think Corbyn really took the initiative. And he's, so he's letting the Tories off the hook. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. What, what do you think of um, John Berko's um, role the last... I mean, he's had a really tough time trying to manage what is a, a unique, unusual situation that we have in Parliament. We've never seen this before. Um, and I think he's... He's, he's certainly spent a number of hours in the chair, do you think? How do you think he's handled I, I, it? See, I, I have a soft spot for John Burke. He's, he's to the right of Genghis Khan, right? There's no, no holes barred on that. But, I, I, but, I, but he's got the measure, and he hates the Tory leadership. Now, I remember when I was first elected to Parliament, uh, Burke invited me in 
for tea in his, in his yeah. exotic chambers that he has in his <laughs> chamber. So he says, George, um, you have to remember that Parliament is just like a village, except there's more than one village idiot. And I thought, he, he, I mean, he's, he's, he's a very funny guy. He just hates the Tory hierarchy. So he's actually quite a good person to have there uh, in the Speaker's chair because he'll do anything to upset the present mm. government. So he's the guy who, he's the one who's you know, created this tradition of dragging in ministers uh, you know, at a moment's, moment's notice to answer questions. And he keeps them in the chamber answering questions every last MP has had a chance uh, to have their say. So uh, uh, no wonder the Tories want rid of him. So uh, uh, for all his faults, for all the, all the fact that I may disagree with him politically on so much, I think he, he is making sure um, that the government doesn't run away with this. Mm -hmm. I think, um, to be fair as well, our colleagues that were down there before um, 2015 were saying that, um, in general terms, he was pretty fair about trying to get everybody in across the chamber, to give everybody their say. He seemed to recognise that, to a certain extent, all MPs are elected equally and therefore should be able to have their say in the chamber. Um, and whilst it's still this ridiculous arcane process, I think he did try and make sure that we were all able to have our say. I, I agree. No, he, he, you, you know that you'll get in eventually. But the convention of the House, of course, is yeah. you have to sit through the whole debate. Well, yeah, I can understand that. You, you know, you're expected to show respect and listen to what everyone has to say. Trouble is, if it's a long debate, uh, and you've probably done the same, I've sat there on the green benches for 12 hours. Uh, you, can get out, you can go to the toilet. But you know, and the, I have to say, because the viewers won't know this, that the, the, the benches are, are plastic and horrible and mm -hmm. sticky. And if you sat there you know, for 12 hours, you really feel it. Um, but Berko does let people in. The trouble is there's a convention in the way the House calls people, mm -hmm. which is annoying if you're in the SNP. Um, they'll call privy councillors first. So all, the, all the, the grandees, the great and the good, get called first. So the hours of that go by. Uh, and then um, they'll, they'll do a ding-dong between Labour and Tories because Labour are the uh, official opposition, not that much of an opposition, let me say. So, it's the, so that, all that has to come first before they get to the SNP, which is why SNP members come in at a rush at the end. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I, would, I think we should complain about that. I think there could be a better way of seeding in um, the, the smaller parties uh, evenly through a debate so the SNP members are called all the way through rather than sitting on their bahookie till, till the very end. Yeah, because it does, it does seem a bit strange that you, know, you could be spending that 12 hours in the chamber um, and whilst obviously you want to be part of that debate and you want to hear what's been said um, in general terms in any other working environment it's not exactly a good use no, of your time. No, and a lot of boring speeches yeah. that you have to sit through. Absolutely. And, and repetitive stuff. Yes, yes. Yeah, and people saying the same thing. Or people saying the same speech yeah. every time they get up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think what I found interesting um, yesterday was um, Lloyd Russell Moyle when he grabbed the mace. Um, was that yesterday? Dave? I can't even remember now. When he grabbed the mace and, and there was an outcry from particularly from the Tory benches um, and it struck me that we seem to have got much more upset about somebody picking up a bit of metal than oh. we have about the utter chaos this country is facing right now. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, there are sometimes occasions when the, the, the arcane, ancient, obsolete processes in the house drive you crazy. I mean, I remember once, I mean, I, I went down, there was a bit going on, I went, I just walked down the side of the chamber past the, the Labour benches to... to liaise with somebody and the speaker got really upset because you're not allowed to, you're not, you're, not, you're not supposed to go down there at this point it's just like nobody noticed um uh, i'm old enough to remember when 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 michael heseltine seized the mace mm. and started whirling it around his head and the theory is that if the mace is not in his place then parliament is not sitting and you can't debate but it's just a symbol you mean you need to relax a bit well i think um um Mr. Russell Moyle's idea was, he said, um, when he when he was challenged that it was disrespectful to do that, um, his answer was that actually the way Theresa May and her government are treating the House of Commons was completely disrespectful, and I think he has a point there. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, to, to if they weren't going to have a vote on the Brexit deal, then they shouldn't have had the debate. But to go through all the hours and hours of people you know, waiting, as we've just been saying, their turn to be called, have the speech, 
and then just to you know guillotine the things thought dead um, and you know and to send I was eating, what really annoyed me was her sending government ministers like Gove into the TV and radio studios to swear in a stack of Bibles yes there's going to be a vote tonight no there wasn't I mean I, I, it's not just parliamentarians who are being lied to it's the people it's the electorate who are being lied to that's, that's the really annoying thing and do you think um, the electorate really understand what's going on there do they th are, are people just so sick to death of I mean this this whole thing's been going on for two years for a start um, are people just so desynthesized to it now because it's just rumbles on and on and on that, that mm. they don't take any interest well I mean you and I are both political geeks but even I have been turning the telly off or finding another channel um, because it just it's, it's going on and on this whole Brexit debate but nothing is actually happening very much and it's largely down to, to uh, Theresa May and, and the cabinet because they, they have a deal, it's the wrong deal, um, they can't sell it to anybody in parliament mm -hmm. and so they're just, you know, they're just you know, keeping the ball in the air to think of something, you know, what else can we do? Um, so it's no wonder that ordinary folk are scun out. Um, and I, I don't think it's people are uninterested and I certainly don't think it's because people don't take an interest or, or are ignorant about facts but they just want something resolved and they know that nothing is being resolved at the moment so we need to go on with our, you know, we've got, got lives to lead um, and the danger is what happens to democracy if you, if you, if you take, if you subvert the system so much um, because we should be having a vote, we should be having an election, we should be having uh, a, 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 another Brexit vote, we should let the people decide if there's, a, if there's an impasse um, but this government is just trying to manoeuvre to find a way out and it's not happening and so yeah people turn off. Do you think as well though that people are not really aware of just potentially how catastrophic this could be either her bad deal or her no deal um, I mean we've heard talk of stockpiling medicine and food and, and the army in the streets are people thinking that that can't be right? That's that's you know too far fetched. Do you think people really know? And I don't think it's helped with the fact that the the mainstream media don't probably give them all the information. No, I, I agree. I mean, I I I suspect that both sides uh, are manipulating the truth a bit. Uh, and um, and I, mean, I don't think that you know one minute after uh, a hard Brexit that you know the ports stop and nothing mm -hmm. happens. Um, but it is certainly true um, that the May government has done relatively little in the way of contingency planning and therefore the closer we get uh, to the end of March the more, the more something, something could go wrong uh, I don't think everything will go wrong but something is going to go wrong um, and I, I, I do think that um, we are not being told enough because it's not in the media, media actually the, 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 both television and print media these days um, it's so, you know, it's so dominated by political position rather than simply reporting the news, which is why broadcasting Scotland's a good idea, um, getting a plug-in. Um, so I, 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 think, I think people are, are genuinely concerned. Um, um, but it's interesting, if you, if you look at what's happening in the business side of things, um, there's been a lot of worry that there would be you know, a collapse in the stock market, a collapse in the value of the pound. Now that is not happening. Um, what's really happening is this, everything's stopped uh, and, you know, and people are just waiting for something to happen. If you look at, you know, if there's, a, there's, a, there's a particular financial market that only geeks like me know about, which is where you take out um, special insurance called derivatives uh, in case anything disastrous happens to interest rates or exchange rates. And the volume of trading on derivatives market is spiked. It's higher than it was at the time of the 2008 um, financial crisis, right. which proves the business community is worried. They don't know. They don't know what to do because they don't know what will happen. Therefore, they don't know what to be worried about. So they're just taking insurance very quietly, you know, in the background. So that is a sign that uh, people are perturbed. They just don't know which way to jump. And talking about businesses, obviously, um, some of the the stuff that's been spoken about is the the special deal for Northern Ireland, so particularly Belfast. 
would mean that there could be a detrimental impact on Scotland because it would, if they are still in the single market and European Union, etc., then if they're still accessing things, it, it, it would be easier for businesses to go and do business there than it would be mm. to come to Scotland, who's getting dragged out sure. um, with the rest of the country. Would you say that was a fair analysis? Well, it, it, it's, it's an issue. I mean, it surprises me because I, I was brought up in, in, in Northern Ireland for a long time. Um, the Good Friday, Good Friday Agreement, it's an it's international law and it leaves Northern Ireland half inside Europe mm. and half inside the UK. It's a, it's a special deal. Did nobody notice this? So it's quite clear that whatever deals are eventually done, Northern Ireland will have special status and special access um, to the rest of Ireland. Actually, I, I never like this notion of, of people talking about the border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, because the border is actually the seacoast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, the, the border between the North and the South is imposed by, you know, by, by the UK. But the spe a special relationship has been built and it will remain between the North and the South. Now, um, because of that, it could well be, um, particularly if, if there's a hard break or something untoward happens, that companies in, on the UK mainland will find it advantageous to shift to Northern Ireland because that gives them preferential and easy treatment um, to the single market. I think Scotland might be um, impacted more quickly because of the, the, the close relationships uh, in business terms and, and, and otherwise. Um, but it's not just Scotland would be affected. I mean, mm. if you were if you were a company in in, in Liverpool, I mean, yeah. it might make sense just to uh, nip across to to, um, uh, to Belfast and take advantage of the markets. There. And obviously, um, the, there was the Northern Ireland special circumstances, and then we saw Gibraltar getting brought in there as well. But but overall, um, there has just been an utter disrespect for Scotland mm. in this whole negotiation protest process, process. Um, and. They, it's just, a, do, is it a deliberate thing, do you think, or do you, I mean, what, what is there a, her idea of just practically sidelining us? Well, I mean, I think, I think for some people in, in government, the Tory party, it's deliberate, and for others, it's just they just don't get, they, they don't, I mean, Scotland is a geographical entity in some way, you know, they've, you know they may have been there, they may not. Um, but they, they, don't, they don't understand we're a nation, and you, they, they will use the phrase Scotland's a nation. Uh, and they'll talk about the union, which would lead you to imagine that they, they understand the logic of the union of separate mm -hmm. nations. But they don't actually appreciate that a nation takes decisions as a nation. And so clearly we have not been um, respected in the, at that level of constitutional uh, negotiation. And every time, I, this is a personal thing, every time I hear... Um, Theresa May talk about our precious union, as she did this morning when she came out uh, on the doorstep of number 10 to, to, to say she was, she was going to fight to the death to remain Tory leader. I mean, I, I, it's a phrase that grates, because if you really believed it was a un precious union, you would treat the different parts of that union equally. And the fact that two, part, two of the four constituent nations voted to s remain in the EU, you take that into account. But no, whereas they'll, 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 they'll think carefully about Ireland, Northern Ireland, the, Scotland, similar situation. They ignore, they ignore Scottish susceptibility, Scot the way Scotland voted. And in the end, it doesn't actually matter the motive. I'm, you just should be outraged because if you, if you wanted to destroy a precious union, the best way of going about it is not actually to recognise the constituent parts of that union and to give them equal reference when you're making your decisions. And obviously we had the, the Parliament were, were voted in contempt of Parliament and again that's the first time that that's um, ever happened. But it almost seems like in some ways we have just normalised things because it, it's, as if it's, it's as if it wasn't that serious and it doesn't really matter, we'll brush it under the carpet and we'll just move on. It seems extraordinary that, that we're in this circumstance but it's not taken seriously. Uh, uh, absolutely, I mean... When people come to write history books or do their PhDs on the last two years, they'll be amazed. Here was a government, Theresa May's government. First of all, it, it said, well, you, the parliament is not having a vote. Uh, and we're just going to activate Article 50. That had to be taken to the law courts. They had to be forced by the law courts, uh, kicking and screaming, to give parliament a meaningful vote, which they haven't yet, of course. Um, then um, uh, we've had the, the, uh, the law court case that went to the uh, European Court of Justice, initiated by... Joanna Cherry and some very, you know, some really 
um, bright people in Scotland, yeah. um, forcing the government to accept. And the government members of this government fought tooth and nail to try and stop that case going to the European mm -hmm. Court of Justice. So, I mean, they say we don't want the European Court of Justice to, to, um, to, say, to interfere in, in, in UK affairs. I mean, they they don't accept. They're not. They don't believe in the rule of law. Actually, yeah. in, in the, as you've seen this time and time again, also all through the last two two years. Um, so I think it's quite frightening, and I, I you know I you know I, I think it beholds um, any constitutionalist, it doesn't matter whether Tory mm -hmm. or or, uh, or Labour or, or, or SNP, this government is breaking the constitutional norms, and that's a danger for democracy. Absolutely, absolutely. And obviously, um, you know, I think from the point of view of, you, you mentioned um, the, the Scottish guys that took it to the, the European Court, and that was cross-party well, um, as well. Um, and you would think, well, well, normally you would have thought that um, that ruling coming back saying, Do you know what, we can, we can stop Brexit, we can halt it, we can just draw a line under it. We've realised that it wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Um, let's start again. Mm -hmm. You'd have thought Theresa would have grabbed that with both hands and said, "Here's my get out clause. You know, let let's move with this." But instead, it actually seems to have had the opposite effect. Yeah. She's dug her heels in even mm -hmm. more. I mean, I've never quite understood her psychology. I understand some of the other cabinet members. Uh, I mean, Philip Hammond, who's the who's the chancellor. I mean, right the minute after Brexit. Um, after the Brexit referendum in, in, in 16, Hammond's game plan was just to delay and delay and delay. And even if you ended up a settlement that, that Britain was technically outside the EU, he wanted, because basically he represents the city of London, to stay as closely aligned to the EU as possible and stay in the single market, stay in um, uh, the, the customs union, or call it by another name, but stay as close as possible. And I know that because he told me that. Uh, and that's why he was the first person to come up with this idea of a transitional period, which is just code for let's stay in as long as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, keep the transition period going until, you know, um, a month of Sundays. So I know what he's up to. And I know what people like Liam Fox are up to. Um, Fox's game plan is just let's, you know, let's do the, the, the you know, get the, the, get the divorce papers through. And then we'll tell them to go to, go to, to Hades. Um, May in the middle, I've never figured out what her what she wanted. Mm. Um, because she was a Remainer. She was a Remainer, a uh, soft Remainer, but she was a Remainer. Um, but she's not, I mean, but her original, you know, her, her original speeches in, in, the, in the first six months a year um, uh, uh, were, were much more, you know, I have to negotiate, it will be a real Brexit. Um, but she kind of moved away more towards the kind of Hammond line of, you know, let's stay as close as possible, call it something else. Um, I, it's almost as if you know she doesn't have a strategy. It's like I am just—it's me. And she was like this in the Home Office. It became more and more about 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 her. Uh, I don't know whether you found this, but when you when in Parliament, when you, when you ask her questions, you can just see that flicker of fear that she doesn't quite know the answer, and then she becomes the Maybot. Which I know is that was a horrible sexist term, but it does kind of. It, it grasps something of her, her psychology that, you know, it, when she's in trouble politically, she just becomes as robotic. Yeah. She, she repeats the mantras, yeah. time to drive yeah. you crazy. Mantra, 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 you know, um, strong and stable, you know, uh, no deals, etc. Et she does that. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if she's on automatic pilot. There really isn't mm -hmm. a strategy. Um, if you're looking for what are the political forces at work behind her, there's a foot, there are. The City of London, the Hammondites, the people who want to stay, you know, they'll have accepted we have to call something Brexit, but it's not going to really be Brexit. And you've got the mad English nationalists uh, around Rees Mogg, um, who are, you know, in fairyland. And you've got people like um, Fox, who's a much more calculating, desiccated calculating machine, um, who has a notion of let's, you know, we'll get out because we want to build a new kind of close alliance with America and Trump, etc. Et what do you think the impact of all the resignations had on her? Do you think that was water off a duck's back or was she sitting there? Blinkered, and, blinkered. Yeah, 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 not thinking that, it's, well, we'll just replace them and it doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't seem to matter yeah. at all, does it? And then, obviously, there's all this talk of um, the Norway plus plus and Canada plus and, and whatever, but again, these are just rhetorics, aren't they? Really, mm. nobody knows 
what that actually means. It's not being looked at properly. And and it's just stuff they're throwing out there to bamboozle people, I think. Uh, absolutely. And, I mean, whether you're talking about Canada Plus or, or Norway, whatever, that's a negotiation that comes after mm -hmm. you've discussed the settlement for the exit for the divorce as a formal EU member. I mean, uh, sorry for the folks out there, um, particularly people who are driven crazy by politics. Even if she delivered this deal, and we came, the UK came out in March, there's another two, three, four, five years before they negotiate the Canada plus the Norway, whatever is the actual deal. I mean, this, we're nowhere near actually the, the hard nuts and bolts discussion. So, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's crazy. And I, my, my fear is, you know, this just leads to uh, you know, erosion of politics and democratic norms. So Scotland, I mean, in my personal view, Scotland needs to get out as fast as possible, mm. escape this morass. I mean, there was um, an interview recently, and I can't remember who it was with, it was um, one of the, the Norwegian um, representatives, and basically, you know, she was saying that um, the UK had almost embarrassed themselves with the way they've behaved, um, so why would they allow them, why would they want to work with yeah. them? Um, when they couldn't, you know, trust them, and and wider than that, what what do you think the world is thinking about us right now? <laughs> I think, I mean, you you could. It's very interesting just looking at the at the the European press yesterday after the abortive um, Brexit vote. Um, they're just like, how do you explain? I mean. It's like the, the, the rationality well, is just, broken. We're now. going over to make okay, us right. George, so let's see what the, let's see the, the, the report. Right up until early Monday, even in the face of press reports to the contrary, the UK government was adamant that such a vote was going to take place. On Sunday, the Brexit secretary said the vote is going ahead. On Monday morning, the Scottish secretary, the always loyal and always straightforward David Mundell, speaking from Peterhead Fish Market, was adamant that the vote was on. And that paragon of plain speaking, Michael Gove, when asked directly on Monday the question, is the vote definitely 100% going to happen, answered with a single word, yes. Yet just minutes later, the press was being briefed by other cabinet ministers that the vote was off. Presiding officer, Monday morning was a, a watershed moment. It revealed for all to see that what is now in office in the UK is a government in a state of collapse. And the Prime Minister, who could not command the support of the House of Commons on Tuesday, does not now command the confidence of many in her own party. It's a government out of ideas, out of talent, out of time, and needing to be put out of office. Most seriously of all, it's a government whose word from any minister cannot be trusted, and indeed isn't trusted by anyone who has to work with it. That's why the EU is insisting so strongly on a watertight backstop. It simply does not trust the UK government to honour its commitments, no matter what any minister says. And moreover, it is a government which makes crucial decisions, decisions affecting business, commerce, investment, health, public services, food security, and the fate of all its citizens, on the basis of what that decision will mean, not in terms of the public good, but in terms of what is good for the Conservative Party, as the Prime Minister herself confirmed outside Downing Street this morning. Later this afternoon, my colleague Derek Mackay will deliver his budget statement against that backdrop, a backdrop of uncertainty and insecurity in the public finances caused by the Tory Brexit chaos. That is an intolerable situation in which the UK government are placing the people of Scotland, and it cannot go on. Scotland and the UK must not continue to be blighted by this never-ending Tory civil war in which we are now all merely collateral damage. The Speaker of the Commons described the decision to delay as discourteous, but it's more than that. It's disgraceful and it's contemptuous. But why should that surprise us? That's been the UK government's attitude for months, perhaps even years, and the Scottish government has experienced it regularly at first hand. The Prime Minister and her government has persistently proffered false choices, absolutist positions and self-defeating red lines to the EU and to the devolved administrations. This approach does not, could not, and would never, in the Prime Minister's hypocritical words, bring the country back together. Nothing she or her government have done in the last two and a half years has achieved that. Nothing they are doing today will achieve that. Nothing they can offer could achieve that. 
Not least presiding officer because by removing Scotland and the UK from the single market and the customs union and adopting with relish a hardline rhetoric and practice on migration, the deal will make every one of us poorer, will deprive us of the company and contribution of many of our fellow EU citizens, especially in key areas such as health, research and agriculture, and lead to many more years of uncertainty and protracted negotiations. Not this, just this deal, but this Tory government is divisive, damaging, and must be defeated. Now, the first step to resolving a political and constitutional crisis, the like of which none of us has ever seen, is for the Prime Minister to get out of the way. Her backbenchers and her payroll vote might not agree tonight, but there's no doubt she is entering the end game of her time in office. But we need more than that. What happens now is about much more than who leads a single political party. And the decision about where we now go has to be taken by more than a single political party. So the second step is for all of us who recognize the huge dangers of this moment to coalesce around a way forward that can resolve the crisis. At the same time, we must strain every sinew to avoid what the extremists want, time to pass so that no deal is the only possible outcome. That must never happen. And as the Taoiseach indicated yesterday, it doesn't need to happen. Speaking in the Doyle, he said this, the option is there to revoke Article 50. The option is there to extend Article 50. And whilst there may not be a majority for anything, or at least any deal at the moment in the House of Commons, I do believe there is a majority that the UK should not be plunged into a no-deal scenario. He said it is in their hands at any point in time to take the threat of a no-deal off the table, either by revoking Article 50, or if that is a step too far, by extending it. So it's incumbent on those who desire a better alternative, one that protects jobs, livelihoods and communities, to come together, first of all to remove the threat of no deal, then in a determined but realistic way to consider and choose the best way forward. Let me set out the alternatives and indicate the Scottish Government's preference. People in Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. <laughs> In line with their wishes, the Scottish Government has always said the best option is to stay in the EU. Of the available alternatives, the one which needs to be the top of that list is therefore a second EU referendum with the option to remain on the ballot paper. As we know from the European Court of Justice, it would be for the UK Government to decide to revoke the Article 50 notification. That judgment makes clear, and of course subject to referral for final decision back to the Scottish Courts, that under EU law, a member state which has notified its intention to leave can, in layman's terms, change its mind and think better of it. It's no longer an option for the UK government to claim no such process is possible. So with that certainty in place, putting the choice back in the hands of the people must now be taken seriously. The Court of Justice said that notice of revocation must be made in accordance with the constitutional requirements of a member state and must be unequivocal and unconditional. It therefore seems likely that, consistent with the process for notification in the first place, a referendum followed by an Act of Parliament would be a sensible way forward. First, though, the Prime Minister must go to Brussels and make a request to extend Article 50. She could actually do that at the European Council tomorrow, presuming she's still in office. And as we have seen, the Taoiseach and others have said they would consider that if the request was made for reasons of significance, rather than just to save her political scalp for a few more days. Those reasons would include a referendum with a clear choice to remain. That approach is possible. It's likely to succeed, to create the space needed for calm thought and wider agreement. By contrast, renegotiation, on which the Prime Minister is now fixated, is not possible, nor will it succeed in producing a majority in favour of the Prime Minister in the House of Commons. That way lies more confusion, more insecurity, and more constitutional chaos. An extension would be needed as the UK Parliament would then go on to pass legislation to set the rules for a referendum and agree a timetable, which whilst truncated would probably mean nothing earlier than the late spring or early summer. Now I trust those in the chamber across all parties who campaign to remain in the EU will agree with me that a second referendum resulting in retaining our EU membership would be a good outcome for Scotland. However, short of the best option of staying in the EU, the only acceptable other compromise, which the Scottish Government has advocated for two years, is for continued membership of the single market and the customs union. 
Now, I stress that would only be acceptable if there was absolutely no chance of staying in the EU. That option of a single market and customs union membership could only be achieved if the UK accepts all of the obligations and benefits which go with it, including the four freedoms. That, of course, would allow the continuation of freedom of movement, which is essential for Scotland and for almost every sector of our economy. The UK government could request an alteration to the political declaration to make clear that the UK wishes the basis of the future relationship to be in the EEA and a customs union, with all the rights and obligations that go with that. And in such circumstances, the Irish backstop would never need to come into force. We could then use the transition period to negotiate the detail of the UK's EEA association agreement, including in those areas which do not come as part of the existing EEA agreement for EFTA countries. The third possibility is a general election. I suspect this would be harder to pass in the House of Commons, but the SNP would support such an option arising out of a successful vote of confidence. But such a vote of confidence <coughs> needs the votes of the principal opposition party to succeed. Presiding officer, I want to say two final things. The first is on preparedness for all eventualities. No responsible government should allow the UK to fall out of the EU in a disorderly way or even in a managed way, as some of the Brexit fanatics are now talking up. As we have seen, the UK government could remove that threat this week. But unfortunately, that's not a step the Scottish government can take unilaterally. And so we must, as a responsible government, continue our preparations for such an outcome. As previously indicated, I intend to make a further statement next week on those preparations. I assure the Chamber that the Scottish Government is doing everything it can to prepare for such an eventuality. But equally, I must make it clear that no government will be able to do everything required in such circumstances. Secondly, I want to make it clear it's not just the Brexit clock that is ticking. For two and a half years, the Scottish Government has proposed compromise after compromise and spent hundreds, probably thousands of hours, in discussion and negotiation. I believe that we at ministerial and official level have shown tolerance in the face of sometimes willful ignorance of devolution, the flouting of the norms of cooperation, the withholding of information, and the refusal to discuss and negotiate in the positive spirit which we, and I have to say, the Welsh Government, constantly have brought to the table. But we've not been treated as partners, still less as equals. I believe that most MSPs in this chamber have similarly tried to save the UK from the worst excesses of Brexit. But so far, to no avail. We continue to offer solutions, as I have done again today. But if these outcomes are constantly ruled out and arrogantly dismissed by Westminster, arrogantly dismissed by the Prime Minister herself, then we in this Parliament must ask ourselves this question. Why should people in Scotland, the people we are here to represent, have to pay the price of such a catastrophic policy that they do not support and which will harm their life chances and opportunities for generations to come? Put bluntly, presiding officer, if we cannot save the UK from itself, we must find a way to save ourselves from the UK. Scotland does deserve better. No reasonable person looking at the cluster burach at Westminster this week could deny it. So finding a way to do things better will, it must inevitably, become an increasingly important task for everyone, as we all should in this chamber, who believes in our country, in its potential, and in our future. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement, and I intend to allow around 30 minutes for that. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. I have a lot of requests. I will do my best to allow everybody to ask the question they wish, but would members bear in mind that questions and answers should be succinct to allow this. And the first is Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement. Presiding Officer, everyone here will understand that today is a difficult day with the Prime Minister under unprecedented pressure. And whatever the limitations on what they may be able to say in public, whatever the limitations, Presiding Officer, on what they may be able to say in public, I know that there are members right across this chamber who privately admire the Prime Minister, her resilience and her tenacity. 
And whatever. Uh, it's, excuse me, Mr. Tomkins. We've just started this session. Can we at least start off with a bit of good behaviour? Thank you, Adam Tomkins. Whatever our differences, presiding officer, most of us, I think, would concede that she has worked tirelessly to secure from the European Union a deal which she genuinely believes is in the country's best interests. And for my part, I wish her well, and she continues to have my support. Presiding officer, my role in the ongoing Brexit saga has, I suppose, been twofold. First, I have sought to resist the SNP's attempts to use Brexit as an excuse to launch a second independence referendum campaign, and whatever happens, I will continue to do that. The second, I have tried, as I hope the Cabinet Secretary would acknowledge, to ensure that Brexit is delivered compatibly with our devolution settlement. And that's why I and colleagues resisted Clause 11 of the Withdrawal Bill and ensured that it was replaced and amended before that bill was enacted earlier this year. Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary and I have crossed swords on Brexit many times in this chamber, and I'm sure that we both wish that we could be talking about something else. Today, I find myself in agreement with much of what he has said. Not everything, but with much of what he has said. And in particular, I agree that all necessary steps should be taken to ensure that we do not crash out of the European Union on a no-deal basis. Does the Cabinet Secretary not agree with me that one means of achieving this result would be to back the Prime Minister's deal and to support her ongoing attempts to get that deal through the House of Commons? Michael Russell. I'm, um, I'm sure this is going to surprise Mr Finlay, but when I listen to Adam Tompkins, I am reminded of uh, John McLean's famous speech from the dock uh, in his uh, trial. And I know Mr Finlay looks surprised at that. And the reason is those words, and I, I read them the other night, because uh, McLean de decided in his last paragraph to say that he was satisfied that he had squared his conduct with his intellect. And I have to say to Mr Tompkins, I am not satisfied that Mr. Tompkins has squared his conduct with his intellect on this matter. Because, as I said last week, I do not believe that he believes a word of this. The way to get a solution to this problem is not to back the Prime Minister. It is to refuse to accept Brexit. That is the way to do it. And indeed, that is the position that Mr. Tompkins took during the referendum. And indeed, that is the position that Scotland still takes and an increasing number of people across these islands take that to be what they wish to do. It is bizarre that a, a, a Tory MPs can get a second vote, that in this case on who should be leader of the party, but nobody else can get a second vote on the issue of Brexit. I think that needs to change. Let me also say this to Mr. Tom, because I, I, I respect him, and I have to say, uh, you know, some of what he has, he has said today I would agree with, just as he would agree with some of what I've got to say, but I wouldn't agree with him. But admiration for the Prime Minister. My thoughts are not with the Prime Minister and her suffering today. My thoughts are with EU nationals who have had months, months of agony over this matter. My thoughts are with the farmers of Scotland, and I met some of them yesterday, who have no idea what is going to happen next. Yes, my thoughts are with the fishermen in my community, yeah. the fishermen in Argyll and Butte, who have been left with no defence and no prospect of selling their product because of the ridiculous nature of the sellout that they have done. My thoughts, my thoughts are with the businesses of Scotland who are facing endless insecurity as a result of this. So I am afraid, as far as the Prime Minister is concerned, if I may quote Shakespeare, Tear falling pity dwells not in this eye. Neil Findlay. Uh, I, I fear I feel the rumblings of McLean having been compared to in the same sentence to Adam Tompkins, I'm afraid. The Cabinet Secretary in his statement mentioned uh, the Welsh Government. Can I first of all begin by congratulating Mark Drakeford on his uh, election as First Minister? President officer, these are very dangerous times for our country, our economy and our communities. Businesses are in a state of flux with no idea how to plan for the future. The pound has fallen and jobs are at risk. For the first time in a thousand years, the government has been held in contempt of parliament. The prime minister is weak, incompetent, shambolic, embarrassing, and utterly hopeless. The Tory party have taken us to the brink of a chaotic departure from the European Union, with the prime minister existing only in the fantasy world of her own mind. Her level of delusion is only matched by her level of incompetence. However, she can always rely on the 
supine sheep in the Scottish Conservative Party, even following the humiliation of David Mundell on Monday at Peterhead Fish Market. On the one hand, she spends weeks warning a diminishing band of people who pay any attention to her that this deal cannot be changed, only then to pollute the atmosphere flying around Europe in a vain attempt to change the deal she said was fixed. President officer, the Prime Minister has zero credibility, is sidelined in Europe, is in contempt of Parliament, loathed within her own party. The DUP have bailed out. Her time is up. And the country's crying out for change. So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that this goes way beyond Brexit? And for those affected by universal credit, for those affected by poverty and pay cuts, and the impact of a broad sweep of Tory policy, we need a general election now to end this shambolic paralysis. Michael Russell. Well, I would, I have indicated I would support a general election and I, I think that the points that the Neil Finlay makes are, are well made. Uh, it is not simply the Prime Minister that is a problem, it is the Tory government that is a problem. Uh, Brexit is the, is the symptom, the huge symptom of a government that is completely out of ideas, out of time and operating against the national interest. So, of course, if the opportunity exists to remove this government of general election, the, the SNP will support that. Can I say, presenting officer, I, I want to associate myself with with Newfoundland's remarks about Mark Drakeford, whom I'm very pleased to call a friend. Um, I've worked with him over the last two and a half years in very difficult circumstances. I congratulated him privately on Thursday when he was elected leader uh, of the Labour Party in Wales, and I am very pleased to see him as First Minister in Wales. And I hope I will have the opportunity to go on working with Mark, because I regard Mark's contributions to this have been very significant. It does show that you can work across party on these issues and manage to maintain a, a constructive and positive working relationship and an effective one. You may not agree on the final destination, but you certainly agree on the road that we have to take. Ross Greer. Thank you. Um, President Officer, on behalf of those of us who took the case to the European Court of Justice, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Governments for their supportive words since the ruling came in. We always knew that Article 50 could be revoked. We now have absolute legal clarity that that is an option, that this crisis can be ended and that a people's vote is the most likely way to achieve that. So can I ask the Scottish Government, what are they, rather than the SNP as a party, but what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure not just that a people's vote becomes more likely, but to ensure that were it to uh, be passed in the House of Commons, that it can be facilitated as easily as possible here in Scotland? Michael Russell. I, I, I congratulate Ross Greer for his part that he has played in it. Uh, he had a faith and a confidence in the outcome which uh, you know, some of us did not have and therefore uh, I'm always pleased to be proved wrong in such propitious and happy circumstances. And I make, paid tribute to those involved uh, early, yesterday in, in uh, an answer to a question from Mr Crawford. I gave Ross Greer a name check and I do it again here today. In terms of our role, of course, uh, if we have a role to play in facilitating a referendum, we will play that role. This would be uh, presently, as I understand it, a United Kingdom referendum. It would therefore be run according to uh, United Kingdom uh, electoral law. But there would be a role for returning officers, for example, within Scotland to be involved. Uh, wearing a, another hat with my responsibility for elections, I would be glad to do everything we can to help and facilitate that. And should the referendum bill be passed, uh, then, of course, we will row in to make sure that that uh, takes place. We have some experience in referendum bills, so if people would like some advice on a referendum bill, I also think that we'd be happy to give it. Tavish Scott. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, the one thing the, the uh, Prime Minister refused to do at uh, Prime Minister's questions earlier today was, re was remove the threat of a no-deal uh, Brexit. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary uh, noted uh, that. Given that Jeremy Corbyn seems so reluctant to propose a motion of no confidence in this chaotic UK Government, what is the Scottish Government going to do to try and make that happen with other parties at Westminster? Michael Russell. I think I've tried to, to indicate in I've tried to indicate my statement. I, I think it's important that we, we continue to have dialogue, we continue to talk about how we can get things forward. So I'm not going to use this opportunity to attack the Labour Party on this. I am and I know that will disappoint some. But what I am going to do is to say, as I've said in my statement, I don't think a motion of no confidence could succeed without the support of the principal opposition party. So I or, or, well, and that's the, Mr. Finnish out of the DUP. I think there are circumstances where that might not be the case. But what we need to do is to make sure that we continue to find a way to work together. And I, I go back to, to, to what I said about Mark Drakeford. I've been very struck over the last two and a half years 
of the possibility and, 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 and the potential that comes from trying to work with people across parties, even if you don't agree on the final constitutional destination. I've tried very hard in this chamber to do the same, and we did it on the continuity bill. I, I've, I hope that we will continue to do it uh, 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 as these issues arise. So I would be keen that this item, item moves on at the, in the House of Commons. The SNP stands ready to help move, to move this item on in the House of Commons, but equally I, we have to do it. We have to find a way to do it together. May I remind everyone that we'll have to have brevity if we're going to get through these questions. Bruce Crawford, followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary, I wonder, like me, if you have businesses the length and breadth of your constituency are deeply concerned about the huge level of uncertainty that surrounds Brexit. Businesses like McQueen's Gin and Calendar, who are just trying to get on with growing their businesses. Do you agree with me the Prime Minister has just made the uncertainty worse by postponing the promised meaningful vote in a doomed attempt to save our bad deal? Now with a vicious civil war taking part in the Tory party, heaping uncertainty upon uncertainty. Cabinet Secretary, can you tell me when will this, all this uncertainty end? Surely now is time to put the people in charge and hold another EU membership referendum. I'm tempted Michael to pluck Russell. a date out of the air and just give it and see what happens. Uh, nobody can unfortunately say when this will end, regrettably. There is a a heavy irony, but it's a very distressing one, particularly to businesses such as the, the member has mentioned in his own constituency. When the Prime Minister stands outside Downing Street and says, people want us to get on with Brexit, having only 48 hours before cancelled a vote that was meant to conclude the matter. Uh, the reality is this is all about the Tories. It is about this internal division which has bedeviled the Conservative Party to start with, and now the whole of the country for far too long. Uh, and I do feel very sorry for those people who were, of course, trying to back the Prime Minister's deal, not because they thought it was good, because they thought it would bring an end to uncertainty. And, and I regretted we had to say to people that it would not have brought an end to uncertainty. The uncertainty would continue and grow. But the Prime Minister proved that herself by our actions on Monday, by pulling the vote. So we will do everything we can to offer support, to re reassurance and assistance to companies in these circumstances. But what would really help them would be to get this nightmare over with by deciding that we were not leaving the EU and then we could get on with life. Donald Cameron, <coughs> followed by Emma Harper. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary set out a hierarchy of alternative outcomes he would prefer to see, the second of which was for continued membership of the Single Market and Customs Union, described elsewhere as the Norway Plus proposal a proposal which has its pros and cons. Does he accept that one of the benefits of that proposal is that there would be no requirement to negotiate a bespoke set of arrangements so it could be agreed upon straight away and thus deliver the referendum result on schedule? Michael Russell. Yes, I do broadly agree with that. I think that the, it has been an offer for a, a long time. Uh, there are issues in terms of EFTA membership. I mean, not unnaturally, Norway, looking at the prospect of having to get into bed with the UK Conservative Party, is bulking very substantially at it. But it would be possible, I think, to construct a bespoke deal, and it has the advantages that the member has interestingly raised. Uh, it, is, uh, it is clear, it, it is obvious how it would work, and it also in Scotland has the enormous advantage of continuing the four freedoms and particularly freedom of movement. And the member knows, because he's a Highland and Islands List member, mm -hmm. he knows perfectly well that that is absolutely essential for the Highlands and Islands. Without freedom of movement, then there will be continuing depopulation in the constituency I represent, which the, which the member sought to represent at the last election and may seek to represent again, who knows? In that constituency, the depopulation uh, is chronic and is getting worse and will only be accelerated by what is taking place in cancelling freedom of movement. So I, I agree with the member and I, I, I'm grateful to him for his enlightened question. Emma Harper, followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that under the Prime Minister's current withdrawal agreement, Northern Ireland will effectively be in the single market and Scotland will not. This is extremely concerning for ports such as Cairn Ryan in my South Scotland region and I would therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary to give me assurances that the Scottish Government will, con the government will continue to fight against this bourg of a Brexit deal which surely will put Scotland at a competitive disadvantage. Michael Russell. Yes, the, the details of how um, the Northern Irish situation would work uh, really would still require to be, uh, to be fleshed out. But certainly there would be substantial uh, problems in terms of the ports on the uh, western side uh, of these islands uh, when they were looking towards Ireland, particularly towards Northern Ireland. 
Uh, and that has not been thought through. I, I heard when the member asked a question some dissent from the Tory benches about whether or not Ireland, Northern Ireland would continue in the single market. To all intents and purposes, it would. Uh, that is absolutely clear from, from what has been said, and it's quite clear from the answers that ministers have given. Uh, there was an attempt by David Liddington when he gave evidence here uh, to the Joint Committee meeting to play this down. When you see the list of areas which are involved, to all intents and purposes, this is membership of the single market, it would disadvantage Scotland, but it would create issues in terms of a border down the Irish Sea. I seem to remember that there are prominent Conservatives in Scotland who said they would resign in such circumstances, but I don't remember seeing their resignation letters. Pauline McNeill, followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you. Notwithstanding the level of despair there is across the country today, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that there is still common ground to fight for amongst the Remain parties, especially if we were to be part of a customs union which would negate the need for the backstop to protect the interests of Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland? And is it worth Cabinet Secretary reminding people that we don't really have a deal, what we have is a withdrawal agreement with the detail of a future deal still to be negotiated? Michael Russell. A, a, a very important point. Uh, the withdrawal agreement is a legally binding agreement uh, about how you get out of the EU. Yeah. It says nothing about what happens next. Uh, the political declaration is not legally binding. It is vague and insubstantial. It is, uh, it is a language of aspiration uh, and nothing beyond that. And that is why there is no security or, or confidence in Theresa May's deal, because there is no certainty about what will happen next. Uh, and that is another reason for saying it should not be supported. So I'm happy to remind people that, we are, uh, that what we have just been through was actually meant to have been the easy part of the negotiation. We're about to go into a part of the negotiation over a number of years which is much, much more difficult. And as they haven't been able to manage this with any ability, who knows how bad it could come when they start to manage the hard part. Tom Arthur, followed by Jamie Green. The Cabinet Secretary was absolutely right to quote Shakespeare because for the Tories, the native re resolution has been sickly over. The, I, I cannot believe we're in this position that we're in today. Can you get to and your question, please, Mr. Arthur? This line that Theresa May's deal Can is you get the only question, deal please, on Arthur? the table. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the European Court of Justice judgment that Article 50 can be revoked by the UK is all the proof needed that the Tories' bar barely credible claims have been blown out of the water? Michael Russell. I, I do agree with that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Russell. You caught me unawares there. And Jamie Green followed by Jenny Gordon. Thank you, Mr Ringo, sir. Uh, the Minister made prudent reference and statement to preparations for all potential exit outcomes and appreciate we'll be updated on that next week. Uh, but can I ask that if, if in addition to the papers which his government has already produced, uh, in that statement he will provide specific details on any further scenario planning that his government has done, including any potential legislative consequences for this parliament. Michael Russell. Well, uh, the member will have to wait for my statement next week, but uh, allow me to say that given that the way in which the Tory party have behaved has created these difficulties, that is resulting in an enormous amount of additional work for civil servants, uh, for ministers and uh, for public officials all over, plus businesses, um, I think that the, minister, that the member would be wise to accept that when doing our best, we will also bring to this chamber as much information as we possibly can. And to simply ask for more and more information would simply add to the burden to create a, a problem which he has helped to create in the first place. So I think it would be quite useful if he just read the statement, listened to what we were uh, going to say, and uh, perhaps regretted his role in this complete mess. Jenny Gilruth, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. My constituent, Dr Petra Maclay, has lived in Scotland since 2003. She is married to a British citizen. Both her children were born in this country. Dr Maclay is a faculty head and has taught in our schools for over 14 years. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary provide my constituent, who now faces a settled status fee as a direct result of the callous actions of the UK Government? Michael Russell. I have the most enormous sympathy for those who find themselves in that situation. I read a, a tweet this morning. Uh, from somebody who uh, admitted that they were standing trying to fill in the form on their phone in the HR department of their company and they suddenly burst into tears in distress at the experience which they were going through. So I, I think this chamber would want to make it clear that I hope every single member would regard what EU nationals are having to go through as utterly unacceptable. 
we apologize for them having to go through that. It is not of our making, but we're deeply sorry about those circumstances. We, as a government, are doing everything we can to help our own employees, so that's not being made easy by the UK government with this matter. But I hope we might get to the stage where this is simply a, a bad memory and that we've moved into a situation, we go back to a situation where freedom of movement, which is so valuable to Scotland, and the contribution of those people who have come here is so valuable, that we go back to that situation and we say to those people, honestly, this will never happen again. Claire Baker, followed by Stuart McMillan. Um, President Officer, I'm going to an actual pantomime tonight, but first I'll deal with the pantomime of Brexit and the current Conservative Party. Can I ask if the Cabinet Secretary has more detail on the Court of Justice ruling as to what actions would be in accordance with constitutional requirements? And if he believes it is possible to deliver a process which is unequivocal and unconditional, given the divisiveness of this debate as it currently rages across the UK? Michael Russell. I, I think the member raises a, a good point. Um, the reality is that the Court of Judgment ruling is clear. Um, it is quite obvious that there is a process to be gone through. Uh, interestingly, I saw a Tory MP denouncing the Court of Judgment Justice ruling as, as attacking the UK. Actually, one of the biggest losers on the, the, the ruling was the European Commission, whose interpretation of how Article 50 should be rescinded was rejected uh, by the court. There is a simple process to be gone through. The, the insistence upon constitutional due process is not unexpected or unusual. Uh, quite clearly, that is actually how Article 50 should be implemented. And Article 50 itself refers to con the constitutional due process that would be required to give notice of withdrawal. So it's quite obvious that the, the court would say, if you're going to with withdraw that, you must go through the same process. So I think that process uh, is clear. Uh, I think constitutional due process in, an area, in a country that doesn't have a written constitution would be variable, and there would be a number of ways that you could do it. But I would have thought a resolution of the House of Commons would be one, and I therefore think a people's vote informing a resolution of the House of Commons might be a, 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 a double lock on it. Stuart McMillan, followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, has the Cabinet Secretary received any assurances uh, from the, the UK Government about when this vote will actually take place, or uh, does it consider uh, that this is just a cynical attempt to run down the clock, forcing a choice between Theresa May's shambolic a deal or a no deal Brexit? Michael Russell. We have no indication. There is an indication that the UK government regards itself as bound by uh, the previous resolution that says that there should be something by the 21st of January, but given they change their mind all the time and they change their promises all the time, that might mean absolutely nothing. Uh, in, in these circumstances, I have to say, I, I don't overthink the motivations. Seems to me Theresa May wanted to continue as Prime Minister and this allowed her to do so. I don't think it's any greater than that, but it is a shameful thing to reflect of the damage that's being done because of that individual ambition. Liam Kerr, followed by George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. In, in the interest of clarity, the Cabinet Secretary says any notice of revocation must be made in accordance with the constitutional requirements of a member state. What does the Cabinet Secretary understand those requirements to be? Could the Prime Minister do it under prerogative? Does it require an act of Parliament or a referendum? Well, Michael it's Russell. actually, uh, and I don't like to correct a lawyer, but it is, in actual fact, the court that says that. Uh, and it's the court judgment that says that. I think that any, of, any and all of those would do, as uh, I've just said to, uh, in a, answer to a previous question. Uh, I think the, the real issue in here is the determination to do it. Once you're determined to do it, you'll find the right way to do it. You could do it by resolution House of Commons. You could add a, a, an additional element to that by having a referendum. Um, if the member is keen on making it happen, he might even bring a resolution to this parliament to say, advising the UK government that this is what should happen. I don't think that would be enough, but it would be a start. I mean, now that the Tories seem so fixated upon it, could I encourage them to follow through their interests by some actual action? George Adam, followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, President Officer. After a chaotic week in Westminster, Theresa May has become the first Prime Minister in the UK for the last 70 years to can cancel a vote in a major international treaty. Having ceased to govern in Westminster, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it's time that all parties unite to remove the Prime Minister and pave the way for a people's yeah. vote? Yeah. Yeah. Michael uh, Russell. I, I really, if ever, disagree with George Adam, and on this occasion I agree with him absolutely. Joan McAlpine. 
Can I ask the Scottish Government what the financial implications would be uh, for the NHS in Scotland of a no-deal Brexit? Uh, there Michael are financial Russell. implications for, a whole, for all parts of the public sector in terms of a no-deal Brexit. I will try and give some indications next week when I make a statement on preparations for a, a no-deal. Um, I think it's important to say, that, uh, as I don't want to preempt anything that my uh, friend Mr Mackay will say in a few moments, it's important to say that, uh, as I said in my statement, that the, this uh, budget is in the shadow of Brexit. Uh, were there to be a hard Brexit, they would require to be a different set of, of, of budgetary figures and, and, and um, requests made, and that that is a very serious situation. But I will do my very best to give as much information as I can next week, uh, but I, I don't think we will go down to the level of detail of financial, finances on each portfolio. But, for example, the stockpiling of drugs, some of which will have to be stockpiled in Scotland, and the uh, stockpiling of, of consumables within the, the health service will cost the Scottish Government money and that money will have to be brought forward from future years in order to stockpile this year. So there would be implications there. John Scott. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary says that the first step must be to rule out a no deal. Given the Cabinet Secretary also objects to the deal that would do so, can he tell me what mechanism he proposes to ensure that this could not happen? Michael Russell. I, um, I, I, I have a great deal of time for John Scott, but I mean, clearly you know, he wasn't paying much attention this afternoon when I was speaking. So let me go back and, and quote a much greater authority than I am on these matters, which would be the, the Taoiseach, who, speaking in the Doyle yesterday, laid out exactly what would uh, take place. He, he said, and I quote him again, the option is there to revoke Article 50, the option is there to extend Article 50. It is in their hands, talking about the UK government, a government which is familiar, and which I understand he would still support, though for the life of me I can't understand why, it is in their hands at any point in time to take the threat of a no deal off the table either by revoking Article 50 or if that is a step too far by extending it. Now, I'm fascinated by the interest in this, the detailed interest in this that has come from the Tory benches. There may be some hope on this darkest of days that they're beginning to realise the absolute <coughs> mayhem that they are wreaking upon the country. And in those circumstances, were they to approach me and seek a common front and trying to find a way to give that message to Westminster, I'd work with them. That concludes questions on the Cabinet Secretary's statement and we'll move on to the next item of business. Thank you. And the uh, next item of business is a statement by the Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay on the Scottish Government's draft spending and tax plans for 2019-2020. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. But uh, I would urge members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Derek Mackay. This Scottish budget prepares our economy for the opportunities of the future, enables the transformation of our essential public services and builds a more inclusive and just society. It does so in the context of continuing UK austerity and against a backdrop of a UK government careering towards Brexit at any cost. In sharp contrast to the chaos and uncertainty of the UK government, the Scottish government will keep on delivering good governance for Scotland. Just this week, we've had confirmation of 80,000 affordable houses built since 2007. Record low unemployment, the numbers of teachers and teaching students increasing, school attainment improving, and the new Best Start grant starting to provide help for low income parents. For the benefit of the Tories in the Chamber, that is strong government. Yeah. Some 
some might even say strong and stable government doing its job delivering for the people. This budget builds on that strong base. It provides an economic stimulus and supports the sustainability of our public services. This is a budget that safeguards the people of Scotland as best we can from the risks we face using all the powers and resources at our disposal. We all know, despite their promises, the UK government hasn't ended austerity. The UK budget in October 2018 failed to provide much needed direction and leadership for a longer term finances and wider economy. On spending, the Office for Budget Responsibility confirmed in October that the UK government could spend £15.4 billion more and still meet its fiscal rules in 2020-21. There can be no doubt the Prime Minister did not keep her promise to end austerity. Instead, we have austerity delivered by choice, not necessity. Austerity condemned by the United Nations. The price Scotland is paying as part of the UK is economic and social vandalism. The facts are these. Scotland's resource block grant will be almost £2 billion lower in real terms in 2019-20 than it was in 2010-11, a fall of 7%. If this year's budget consequentials for investment in the NHS are excluded, which is reasonable given our commitments to pass all of these consequentials on to health, our 2019-20 resource block grant is £340 million less in real terms than it was in 2018-19. And that puts a huge strain on public spending, which this budget works hard to manage. And it's not just austerity that puts pressure on our budget, Economic consensus warns us of the damage of Brexit. The UK government admitted two weeks ago, in a watershed moment, that it does not matter what kind of Brexit they secure, any kind of Brexit will make us poorer. The Scottish government's position is clear. The best option for the future well-being and prosperity of Scotland is to remain in the EU. If Scotland is forced out of the EU as a result of the actions of the UK government, it is vital that they ensure no detriment to the Scottish budget. The UK government's decision to take us out of the EU single market and customs union, a market of over 500 million people, is reckless and unnecessary, and our growth forecasts are subdued as a consequence. Today, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has published its latest set of independent economic and fiscal forecasts for Scotland. The Commission has revised up its forecast of GDP growth in every year. They now forecast GDP in Scotland to grow 1.4% in 2018, which is faster than the growth expected in the UK as a whole. They then expect the Scottish economy to grow 1.2% in 2019, 1% 1 in 2020 and 2021, 1.1% 1 .1 in 2022 and 1.2% in 2023. However, the Commission highlights that Brexit is a key factor that is expected to lead to slower growth in productivity, population and trade in future years. This means less money for public services and it risks making Scotland a less attractive place for businesses. As a responsible government, we are preparing as far as possible for all exit possibilities and we're intensifying preparations in order to protect the Scottish economy our businesses and our workers. We've set up new teams in the Scottish Government to support preparations, including an international trade and investment policy team. We've doubled the Scottish Development International presence in Europe, and we're investing £20 million over the next three years to enhance and intensify support to businesses looking to export. Significant resources have had to be diverted, not just in the Scottish Government, but across the public sector, to prepare for the impact of Brexit. A no deal Brexit and continued chaos from the UK government will only make matters worse. So it is disappointing but necessary for me to advise Parliament that if the UK does end up in a no deal Brexit, I may be required to revisit the priorities in this budget. However, stepping back from the brink and remaining in the EU would mean that resources could be returned to supporting frontline priorities. 
That is just one of the many reasons this government believes we should remain in the EU. Unlike the UK government, we've chosen to use the levers at our disposal to boost our economy and support our public services. We will continue in 2019-20 to deliver a public sector pay policy that lifts the 1% cap on public sector pay. And I can confirm today that I've agreed a public sector pay policy for 2019-20 which provides a 3% pay rise for all earning £36,500 or less, higher than forecast inflation. It caps the pay bill at 2% for all those between £36,500 and £80,000. And it continues to contain pay rises at the higher end, capping any increase for those earning over £80,000 to £1,600. This is a reasonable and affordable public sector pay approach and continues on a journey of restoration of public sector pay. However, I must disappoint my colleagues and say that ministerial pay will once again be frozen at 2009 levels. Our commitment to public sector workers is part of our commitment to high quality public services. This government has made clear that our priority is closing the attainment gap and improving education. We are determined to improve the life chances of children and young people in Scotland and change the lives of our future generations for the better. This is our defining mission, and that is why I can announce today that the education portfolio will receive a real terms increase in investment in 2019-20. We'll also provide almost 500 million pounds to expand early learning and childcare supporting the recruitment and training of staff and investment in the building, refurbishment and extension of around 750 nurseries and family centres. We'll invest over £180 million to raise attainment in schools and close the attainment gap, including £120 million that will go direct to head teachers through the Transformational Pupil Equity Fund. And we'll invest over £600 million in Scotland's colleges and maintain investment at over £1 billion in Scotland's universities. And to ensure young people have a range of avenues open to them, we'll invest over £214 million in apprenticeships and skills to support the ongoing expansion of apprenticeships in Scotland as we progress towards 30,000 starts per year. This government will continue our work to tackle poverty and mitigate the worst impacts of the UK government's welfare cuts. We're already using the newly devolved social security powers to create a social security system based on dignity and respect. In a recent report on the UK, the UN Rapporteur on Poverty and Human Rights condemned the British government's punitive, mean-spirited and often callous treatment of the country's poorest and most vulnerable. I welcome the Rapporteur's references to the very different approach being taken by the Scottish government, noting the establishment of a social security system guided by evidence and the principles of dignity, fairness and respect, recognising that we are mitigating the worst of UK government welfare cuts and describing our plans for tackling child poverty as ambitious. This government will continue to work to tackle poverty, support new families and ensure that every child has the best possible start in life. And we'll also continue to mitigate the worst impacts of the UK government's welfare cuts. The delivery of the new social security system and the safe and secure transition of the new powers will continue to be a key priority for this government. In 2019-20, we'll deliver fair and dignified social security assistance over and above what the UK government provides, with a total forecast expenditure of £435 million. This will include forecast spend of £37 million for carers' allowance supplement, providing vital support for our carers. £12.4 million for the new Best Start grants to assist low-income families with essential expenses on the birth of a child and at key transitions in the early years. And this will support families with young children who are feeling the impact of the UK government welfare cuts. And £6.2 million for our new funeral expense assistance, helping those on lower incomes with funeral costs. We will also provide nearly £100 million to continue our mitigation of the bedroom tax and the UK government welfare cuts. And we'll increase the budget for our Fair Food Fund from 1.5 million in 2018-19 to 
to 3.5 million in 2019-20, with £2 million specifically to tackle food insecurity during school holidays. Safeguarding Scotland, we will continue the protection of the police resource budget in real terms, provide over £5 million of additional resources to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to support their transformation, and increase the funding to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service by £5 million to recruit additional legal staff to manage increased caseloads. The Scottish economy is the powerhouse that fuels ambition for Scotland, and we are determined to unlock its potential. And I want to see a country that is globally competitive with innovation, sustainability and fairness at its heart. That is why this year I launched our new economic action plan with a number of decisive measures to improve the competitiveness of our business environment. We will support an advanced manufacturing challenge fund of up to £18 million to ensure that all parts of Scotland benefit from developments in advanced manufacturing. Invest £5 million as part of our three-year £20 million plan to boost exports and work with partners to enhance the digital skills that businesses require, including a new £1 million digital start fund to support people on lower incomes. We'll also invest around £2.4 billion in our enterprise and skills bodies and develop the work of the Enterprise and Skills Review and Strategic Board. In addition, the Scottish Government has committed around £1.3 billion to support Scotland's seven cities and their regions to maximise economic opportunity. In 2019-20, we will secure fully agreed city-region deals for Stirling and Clackmannanshire and for the Tay Cities region. We'll progress growth deals for the Ayrshires, Borderlands and Murray. Progress discussions for Argyll and Butte, Falkirk and the Islands and continue our financial commitment for the city region deals in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Inverness and Edinburgh. These investments will benefit all of Scotland, creating thousands of jobs and upskilling local labour markets, building on the economic strengths and opportunities for each region. We have a clear commitment to fair work and employability and as part of this, we will invest £5 million over three years to support around 2,000 women to return to work following a career break. We will support parents to address barriers to work and providing in-work support to help low-income parents remain in work. And we will develop our Fair Work First principle for public procurement so that as much of our funding as possible supports a fair and inclusive economy. Investment in people is crucial. Creating meaningful employment is the best social policy. We also know that greater investment in infrastructure improves quality of life, boosts productivity and makes our country a more attractive place to do business. That is why this government will increase capital investment by £1.56 billion per year by the end of the next parliament. This budget begins that journey and sets out capital investment of more than £5 billion over the coming year, including £1.7 billion investment in our transport infrastructure, more than £180 million towards city region and growth deals, and £175 million of investment in nursery and childcare buildings. Of course, it is vital that the right investments are made to generate inclusive growth and to deliver on our low-carbon objectives. We must act on climate change. Our investments in broadband, transport and utilities will provide a foundation for companies to invest and bring new economic opportunities across Scotland. And as part of this vision, I'll continue with our groundbreaking work to establish a Scottish National Investment Bank. And this budget will provide £130 million of funding to establish the bank and precursor investments. The next £50 million of the £150 million Building Scotland Fund announced last year will provide debt and equity support to the private sector and organisations such as housing associations and universities to support the development of housing across all tenures, develop modern industrial and commercial space and support industry-led research and development. In 2019-20, we'll invest a record £826 million as part of our total of investment of over £3 billion to deliver 
50,000 affordable homes over the course of the Parliament across, across the length and breadth of Scotland. Building for Scotland and building new homes too. As well as building more homes, we're continuing to protect those buying their first home and progressing through the property market with our progressive land and buildings transaction tax. But for those purchasing additional properties and proposing to increase the additional dwelling supplement from 3% to 4%. Legislation will be laid before Parliament tomorrow and if approved, the rate change will come into force on the 25th of January 2019. I've listened carefully to the business community. They seek investment in skills, people, innovation and infrastructure. And this budget delivers such investment. We're committed to providing the best possible environment for businesses, supported by a competitive non-domestic rates regime. Last year, I limited the increase in business rates to CPI inflation. And this year, I will go further. I'm announcing today that we will cap the increases in the rates poundage in 2019-20 in Scotland at below inflation level of 49 pence, limiting the increase to 2.1%. This will ensure that over 90% of properties in Scotland and all small and medium-sized businesses will pay a lower poundage than they would in other parts of the UK. I can also confirm that I'll continue to uprate the poundage in line with CPI for the remainder of this Parliament. Our package of business rates reliefs, including the small business bonus, is the most generous anywhere in the United Kingdom, worth an estimated £750 million in 2019-20, and continuing the growth accelerator will give us a further competitive advantage. I'm also proposing changes to non-residential land and buildings transaction tax, which will mean that Scotland has the most competitive rates in the UK. Under these proposals, two-thirds of all non-residential transactions will pay less tax in future than at present. Again, I'll lay legislation on this change before Parliament tomorrow, and if approved, a rate change will come into force on the 25th of January 2019. These measures will help our businesses grow, prosper, and be successful. We are proceeding with the Barclay Review recommendations to reform non-domestic rates, businesses have asked me to rule out the introduction of an out-of-town levy, a recommendation from the Barclay Review. And while the Barclay Review recommended that we explore this possibility as a means of supporting our town centres, in light of proposed UK taxes, I do not believe it would be right or fair to introduce such a tax at this time. We will, of course, keep this under review. However, I share the view that our town centres require support in a changing retail environment. So I can announce today that we will establish a new £50 million capital fund to support our town centres to diversify and develop, ensuring our town centres are thriving, sustainable places where people choose to spend their time. Presiding officer, last year we took the decision to introduce a new progressive, fair and balanced income tax system that raises additional revenue from those who can most afford it and protect public spending. This helps us make Scotland the kind of country we want it to be, funds our public services, support our economic infrastructure and supports those most in need. Our income tax proposals will continue to follow the four key tests the Scottish Government introduced last year, protecting the lowest paid taxpayers, improving progressivity, raising additional revenue for public services and protecting the Scottish economy. I have decided this year that I will not increase any of the rates of income tax. Tax rates will remain the same. And as a result, 99% of all taxpayers will see no increase in the tax they pay. However, in 2019-20, I'll increase the starter and basic rate bans by inflation to protect our lowest and middle earning taxpayers, the higher rate threshold will be frozen. This will ensure that 55% of Scottish taxpayers continue to pay less than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK, and Scotland will continue to be the lowest tax part of the UK.
For example, a pensioner earning £15,000 with access to free personal care, free bus travel and cheaper council tax will be better off by around £9,700 in 2019-20 relative to the rest of the UK. Well, someone earning £62,149, the same as an MSP, will pay just over £30 a week more in income tax in Scotland than they would elsewhere in the UK. But that's before you consider any of the benefits of Scotland's social entitlements, like state-funded university tuition, which we will continue to protect. <laughs> At a time of constrained growth, prolonged austerity and growing economic uncertainty, all as a result of a failing UK government, now is not the time to cut tax for the highest earners at the expense of our public services. Instead, I will be using the additional resources raised through my tax decisions in this budget to support our public services and ensure that our health service gets all of the additional money they were promised. The UK government failed to deliver in full on of the resources that they promised our health services leaving us £55 million short. My decisions will ensure that we can restore that amount, and I believe this is the right decision for Scotland. Our tax policy supports our public services and investment in our economy, while Scotland continues to be the fairest tax part of the UK. Our economy has grown faster than the rest of the UK in the first six months of this year, and there is no evidence whatsoever in the Scottish Fiscal Commission's report that our income tax policy in Scotland is slowing growth. But I want my decisions to be based always on the best evidence. So I will be asking our Council of Economic Advisers to expand their analysis of the impact of the potential behavioural effects and the possible impact on future revenues. Providing the necessary investment for health in a fair and balanced way this is equipping our frontline services to take forward the measures set out in the health and social care financial framework and waiting times improvement plan. We recognise our NHS and wider health and social care system must continue to adapt to the changing needs of our population. In 2019-20, we'll continue our improvement of these vital services. And I can announce today that I'm increasing the health portfolio resource budget by almost £730 million. That's an increase of almost £500 million in real terms. This decision confirms that health is a top priority for the government and will take spending levels to £754 million over and above inflation since 2016-17, the equivalent of 19,000 nurses. We will also deliver a further shift in the balance of spend towards mental health and primary, community and social care. And as part of this, we're increasing our package of investment in social care and integration to more than £700 million in 2019-20. And we'll increase our direct investment in mental health services by £27 million, taking the overall funding for mental health to £1.1 billion in 2019-20 and this includes our work to improve mental health services support in schools. The decisions I've taken in this year's budget will also allow me to increase funding for local government in 2019-20, providing total support of £11.1 billion. Yeah, yeah. And let me be clear, this provides a real terms increase in both revenue and capital funding and an overall real terms increase and the local government settlement of over £210 million. <laughs> this budget safeguards Scotland, using all the powers, resources and tools available to do so. If opposition parties choose to argue for additional spending in any area, over and above what I've set out in this budget, then to have any credibility they need to indicate where the money should come from. Should it come from a rise in the basic rate of income tax and hit those on lower incomes? Or should it come 
from a cut to public services? And if so, which public services would they cut? The NHS, education or local government? Presiding officer, the Scottish Government cannot completely protect Scotland from the recklessness of the UK Government, but the decisions we've taken in this budget ensures that we protect what matters most. We choose to transform our early learning and childcare, protect funding for education and improve attainment, invest record sums in our health services, provide a real terms increase in total funding for local government, expand free personal care and deliver a fair and just new social security system which will support those most in need. We're doing all this whilst the UK government implodes on their journey of economic self-harm. And that is why the people of Scotland have entrusted us to focus on the delivery of our public services and the economy. This budget delivers for the Scotland of today and invests for the Scotland of tomorrow, and I commend it to the Chamber. Thank you very much. Could I encourage members who have yet to do so to press their request to speak buttons if they wish to ask a question, and I call on Murdo Fraser to open. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advanced sight of his statement, heavily redacted as it may have been. Presiding Officer, it's a source of regret for us all that today's big statement has been overshadowed by events at Westminster. I refer, of course, to the £950 million increase in the Scottish Block Grant announced by the Chancellor in his budget in October. An increase which means that, according to Spice, the Finance Secretary's total budget has not been cut by the Conservatives, but is up in real terms nearly £1 billion since 2010. Yeah. In advance of today's budget, every business representative group in Scotland had one key ask from this Finance Secretary. They asked that the tax differential between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom would not... Welcome back, folks. Um, it was a year ago today we did our first broadcast and that was also in the budget. Um, we've come a long way since then and obviously there's, we have an ambition to increase the programme content and we look forward to your support in that. So we just saw um, Derek Mackay and the budget there. Uh, George, what, what's your initial thoughts? Well, happy birthday <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to broadcast this call. Um, uh, an, an, interesting, an interesting budget, right? What you have to grasp is he, he had got some extra cash from the UK government, from the Treasury, from, from Philip Hammond. We should bear in mind, though, that that wasn't Philip Hammond being Father Christmas. Um, there was a surge in tax payments, particularly from business, in the UK uh, in the middle part of the year. Uh, and I think that's to do with, I think it's very short term, and I think it was to do with people declaring profits now before, again, that, get that out the door before Brexit came along. So suddenly, Philip Hammond's got lots of extra cash. Now, since he got that extra cash, um, tax receipts have been falling off again. But what he did wasn't bank the money. He decided um, to um, spend it instantly, uh, uh, give, give everybody a, you know, a bit of a present, uh, in order to pretend that austerity was over. But it isn't over, um, because if, if the money dies away again, as it has already happened, there won't be any extra cash next year. So a, a short-term bit of money arrives. So we get the Barnet consequential, so Scotland gets an extra billion. So what this, uh, what Derek Mackay's budget is all about, is what does he do with the billion? Now, he's, he's put most of it uh, into the NHS because it's been a cardinal rule of Scottish government uh, um, since 2007 that it will protect, in real terms, NHS spending doesn't mean to say everything's correct in the, SM, in, in the NHS because, of course, we all know we're all getting older, like me, uh, and therefore we take more use of the, uh, of the NHS, so there's a big demand pressure. But the Scottish Government has maintained, uh, in real terms, the spending and even improved a bit if you add in, in the bills and whistles. So that most of the money that Derek has, has, has got garnered uh, has gone in that direction. He's made some other bits of leeway. Um, he's definitely trying to uh, limit the impact uh, on the high street um, by, by trying to limit uh, the, the normal increases uh, in, in the business rate. Mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, and by golly, we need to help the high street because the, the impact of, of slowing consumer spending and the impact of the internet is really, really hurting uh, the high street. You can argue, has he done enough? Uh, and I think that's maybe part of the debate that we'll see um, um, uh, in, in the negotiations mm -hmm. over this budget, because this is, this is just a this yeah. is down payment time. Uh, and I suppose the, the, the final thing uh, I might say is, is, on, is, on, is on local government. Um, local government has been squeezed over the, over, since... since the start of austerity by the Tory government. And there's a reason for that. Um, uh, the Scottish government has, has had its, its overall budget uh, subvention from the Treasury squeezed and squeezed and squeezed in real terms. So the cake is getting smaller. Now, if the cake is getting smaller, but you're protecting the NHS in real terms, something's got to give. So there hasn't been money to keep up with the needs of local government. We all know that, right? Uh, but it's a Tory thing, and, and Labour comes up with, you know, uh, big cuts to local government, and we all sort it. No, they can't sort it, because the money isn't coming um, from central government. Now, um, what, what Derek has done, really, for the first time in, in, in a while, is to try and turn the corner on that, and he has found some extra money in real terms for local government. Does it go uh, anywhere to, you know, filling the gap that has been built up over the last, the last decade? Not yet. But the, the, you, you, what you can say is for the first time he's managed to find real resource increase for local government. And in terms of just what you've said there, um, and, and he's mentioned the integrated social care. Now, obviously, with local authority budgets, um, you talked about an aging population. They tend to be at the front line Indeed. of the services that are needed. Um, and if for, the, for that you know, to be of, of any impact then... But it's about, I think, trying to sort of have that pain at the moment and invest because long term you will reap the yes. rewards for that um, if you can put things in place to help people at this stage to live longer, healthier and more independent. Um, and I think he's kind of tried to touch on Oh, I, 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 Absolutely, because I mean, it's, I mean, one of the revolutions that the Scottish Government has brought in is this genuine, everyone's talked about it for decades, never done anything, but um, bringing together um, uh, social, I mean, social welfare uh, and community care, mm -hmm. and bring that into uh, alignment with um, uh, the, 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 the hospitals and medical service, and get a seamless transition. Um, and that, and, and much of the debate, much of the discussion and, and, and uh, negotiation uh, as to where the money goes between um, uh, uh, the hospital, mm -hmm. the, the, the the, the, the big board, yeah. spending, you know, hospital services and um, the preventative services at the, the local level. So that, that, that's a lot that's been done at local level. Uh, and certainly you need a bit of, you know, or money to, 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 to prime the pump and, and, and smooth over some of the transitions. So, I mean, so it's not going to happen in Tennessee. And he's, done, he's, moved, he's trying to move some extra cash in there to do that. Um, but certainly that will, be, that will produce long-term benefits in terms of, you know, reducing the kind of pressures one would hope on the NHS. Yeah. And obviously we saw um, Mike Russell's uh, Brexit speech before and he kind of touched on um, the, the fact that Derek's having to do this budget uh, at a time that obviously there's all this other stuff going on yeah. and Brexit yeah. and, and deals, no deals. It must be incredibly difficult to try and you know, put something together when actually all the balls are in the air. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, he, he, right at the very beginning of Derek's speech, um, he gave some. Uh, he gave he gave the the, the the fiscal commission's new growth figures. Uh, and that, let me, to be honest, amongst friends, I mean, that it's it's pretty depressing. I mean, it's one point four percent this year, one point two percent next year, one percent the year after that. Now, that's not the Scottish government's fault. That's the impact of Brexit being baked into the, the growth cake uh, by the Fiscal Commission. Now, the problem there is if growth slows, then taxation slows, mm -hmm. and therefore Derek gets less money in than he has budgeted for. Yeah. Um, and so it's up in the air, and as he said there right at the very beginning, because if we get a hard Brexit, the economy goes belly up, the money will not flow in. And remember, we're moving into a new phase of Scottish Government where uh, over the next two years where we, we, we now get the assigned revenues, a portion of the assigned revenues from VAT. Mm. Uh, so if Scottish economy slows, VAT payments slow, then the money, coffers, money coming into the coffers of Scottish government, that slows. So um, I'd say that the Fiscal Commission's growth figures give us cause for worry. Um, Derek is making the best of what he's got, uh, and he's given us a, a, I think he's given us a very serious warning, that unless we, we sort the disaster with Brexit, 
uh, then then things could look really bad mm. in the next two years. And obviously, um, uh, Derek picked up on that himself by by saying that this budget was in the context of the UK austerity and Brexit, but he did try to highlight um, a sharp contrast between the good governance of what the Scottish government has done up until now and what is happening in Westminster. Absolutely. I mean, if you gave, if we got some new numbers on, on house building. Um, people have been complaining the Scottish government isn't, hasn't hit its, its house building target. It was a long-term target. And actually, if anybody knows anything about building, you know, you don't build them all at the beginning. You kind of crank out the machinery and eventually the delivery construction comes at the end. But, but the, 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 certainly, it's very positive uh, 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 experience of the Scottish government on, on house building. And affordable housing, so that that I mean that's he's delivering on that, as we've already talked about the the, the reforms in in the health service, and Derek, of course, um, though it's been um, it, it was has been in the pipeline, but he's he's put he put his money where his mouth is this coming financial year in the money for Scottish National Investment Bank, uh, and once that's a major major reform because mm -hmm. with the, the, the investment bank we can put more money into infrastructure spending, more money into Scottish companies. Uh, and um, my calculation is that within a reasonable period, we will have £20 billion flowing through of, of new investment, mm -hmm. flowing through the Scottish National Investment Bank. That will have a real impact on economic growth. And he, he did put in, or he seemed to put in a caveat there, that he may have to revisit this budget, given the context of what's happening. Oh, abs well. everything is provisional. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if come March... Uh, it's a hard Brexit, then, then you know, the, the, we will be in, 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 in you know, it, it's open season. No one will know what will happen, which is why just before, of course, Derek's um, viewers might have seen, before Derek's speech, they might have seen uh, Mike Russell giving what I thought was a, a superb and, as always, very measured uh, speech outlining what we should be doing. And we have to keep saying we can get out of this Brexit. We, we don't have to negotiate everything with the EU, but that we can we can suspend Article 50 or even abandon Article 50. There is no real time, you know, the, the alarm clock really doesn't have to go off at the end of Jan, at the end of, of March. It's only as if the Tory government is so stupid it lets it go off and then we have a hard Brexit. That would be disastrous. And obviously um, Derek's been keen to try and safeguard the, the, the public sector um, and what he said was a reasonable and affordable approach um, to that and obviously he's, he went on to talk about education and attainment um, and about putting the money in there because obviously the you know the the attainment gap is is a real concern for people and there, there's a whole mix in there of poverty and all sorts of other stuff sure. going on um, but again I think it does highlight that the 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 direction of travel in looking at that and, and making that one of the priorities is completely different from what's going on in Westminster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I haven't seen that. You always have to wait 24 hours and yeah. read, read the small print yeah. of any budget. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the economist geeking me. Um, uh, he, he did talk about about trying to, trying to get a real terms increase in, in, in education spend. Uh, I haven't got the numbers in front of me, so I don't know how much mm. is capital spend and how much is revenue spent? Um, one of the, the new powers the Scottish Government has is it, it, it can borrow for capital spending. Mm. Now, um, it's capped at three and a half billion or something like that, but we haven't used all that up. And what, what the Scottish Government's done over the last three years uh, is to borrow up to its limit, 350 million a year or something like that. It's, it's, good, good, it's not a small change. So uh, I, I suspect some of the, of the education spend money um, has come from the capital budget to um, fund, he was talking about schools and mm. community centres. Mm. Um, uh, I, I think there has been a question mark, give, given all the things that Derek has had to do over the last years, on um, availability of funds um, for universities. And um, uh, we, 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 I, th I personally think long term, University spending is very important because that underlies your productivity. Um, so he, I, I, I'd like to see the, the, the final numbers on, on university allocation of spending. But he's doing, he's, I mean, he's been trying, given, given that he's going to put most of the new money into NHS, mm -hmm. he's clearly been trying to work hard to see if he could maintain uh, at least real term spend in, 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 in education. Because um, there's, there's also the concern around universities and, and the, the sort of Brexit issue and about foreign students coming to 
you know, be here, but whether they would be get access and visas and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And obviously, some of the universities rely on some of that income. Absolutely. I mean, well. for, for foreign foreign students. Um, I mean, they pay their way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not it's not it's not free. Absolutely. They get, I mean, that, and that helps underpin uh, uh, university budgets. Um, so uh, we don't we don't. Uh, um, and also, it's good for it's good for. I mean, it's actually in the long term, it's always good for the economy because if a student comes here um, from from Europe abroad, does the, does yeah. their degree here, and they build up the networks, and sometimes they stay. They and actually, stay. We want more would stay if the, if the UK government would, would devolve uh, immigration to Scotland. Um, but over the years, uh, it builds up economic links, which are good for the mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. So we don't 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 lose that. On, on, another thing on, on just on 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 public sector. Um, Right at the very beginning, Derek said um, he would maintain uh, the abolition of the pay cap and he would guarantee a minimum 3% mm. uh, for all public sector workers across the, across the, uh, uh, the, the broad spectrum. Um, beyond, you know, the higher paid, mm. there's capping and limitation on, on higher paid uh, senior management. So, he, so basically, everyone can look forward to a 3% wage increase minimum. Now, there's a wee caveat I have to put in. Um, uh, everything depends, of course, on inflation. Um, if inflation were to, to tick up, then 3% would, would, be, would be eroded. 3% is a good baseline. Now, um, at the moment, uh, RPI inflation, retail price index inflation, I know this is all kind of gobbledygook, but um, it's a measure of inflation, how far prices are going up, which includes housing and energy, which I think are important. And that's running about 33 so essentially what Derek's finding good finding is much better than other parts of the UK. Um, but if inflation keeps high and ticks up, as it might if the pound fell, because the link of pound goes down, mm -hmm. prices go up because what you're importing is more expensive. Um, if inflation was to tick up over the next uh, year, 18 months, um, then that would press on people's um, take home pay. But clearly Derek is doing his best. Yeah, he's really, because the Tory government tried to impose 1% uh, over over many very many years, uh, so within the, within the, the the limited parameters Derek has got, mm. he's doing his best on wages. And just touching on that as well, obviously the other thing in the mix there is the the value of the pound, and again going forward, what happens with that, and and that's going to impact in imports exports and, uh, and the money that's going um, to come in. What what the psychology of of people of the people who trade. Uh, in the foreign exchange markets is that they have little benchmarks, you see. So they'll say, well, um, the pound should really be there, um, but it is here, and, um, um, and we're worried. And, and, but when it changes, it doesn't change incrementally. It suddenly shoots to the new norm that they thought it should be at. Um, so there's a kind of general feeling that uh, in the markets, you talk to people at the moment, that um, if, if Brexit is going sour with all the uncertainty, the should, pound should be about 125 to the dollar. It's about 130-ish, been bouncing around about there. So uh, but the, I, there could be, and I think the, the uncertainty of having pulled the Brexit vote uh, probably underlines this, it could be that we will see a shift down to, to dollar 25, and that will impact on prices. It takes a little while, comes through, mm. you know, um, six months, a year, but back in the next year, we'll then be looking at uh, a, a, an erosion of living standards. And it's interesting, I think, that um, Derek picked up on, when, when he was talking about poverty, he picked up in the, the UN Rapporteur's report um, and obviously was very damning and in, in what that highlighted and again was um, keen to point out that the Scottish Government seemed to be going in a different direction from Westminster. Yes, I mean, and, and uh, I mean, in a sense, it's outrageous that the Scottish government is having to pick up the bill uh, for the welfare cuts that the Tories have imposed, uh, which is money we could be doing other things with. Because if we could grow the economy, then we wouldn't have the welfare problem we have. Uh, and, and Eric has come up with with, with money, but I, you know, and and I think the the um, more money for the fair food program, mm. uh, which impact. I mean, I tell you the thing, Corey, that. I think I obviously I have, I have throwing things at the television moments, and you know seeing or well, we'll throwing my phone at the wall ones, and all these Tory uh, MPs having their pictures taken at food banks. Mm -hmm. Now this was not this was not from the heart. This was an orchestrated campaign the Tory party set up, and so everyone got their you know their orders from from Tory central office. Go to a food bank and have your picture taken. These are the people who caused the food banks, mm -hmm. and you know and it is it is it is both you know noble of, of Scottish government to find the money. Uh, and given all the other problems it has um, for things like the, uh, the, the, the fair food programme for, for, for 
kids in the summer holidays. But we shouldn't have to have that no. problem in the first place. I think it might have been quite galling for some of the volunteers that man food banks, you know, Indeed. giving up their time to do that. But again, I think, you know, there is that danger of, and we've said it often a bit, normalising this food bank idea that, that it, it surely has to be a government's responsibility to make sure its citizens are fed and a roof over their head. And whilst other people are doing that for them, they're just escaping. Absolutely, that absolutely. Responsibility. And, 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 and you have to worry, apart from Brexit, the other, the other big you know, elephant in the room is universal credit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And universal credit is specifically organised to reduce, cap the welfare spend, yeah. uh, which Labour voted for. Uh, and uh, so and, and now that universal benefit has been ruled out, uh, people come on to it as well as they have to change their benefit arrangements. I think that the, the impact, particularly, for instance, on, on um, people not being able to pay their rent, mm -hmm. And that impacting on local authorities not getting the rent in. Yep. I think that's that's just going to grow and grow as a problem. Yeah, and obviously um, we we talked about mitigating, but I think again one of the other elephants in the room is the bedroom tax because often now I think it has be again become normalised that it yes. doesn't exist because the Scottish government are paying it. Yes. Um, and and it's like you know people on the ground forget that actually our government is spending money to try and make life better for people from policies that, that were not introduced absolutely, by this government. Absolutely. And, and you know, the word is mitigation. As you're, mm. you're mitigating, you're not removing the problem. And that's what we have to do. And we do that by growing the economy and creating real jobs, not the kind of phony jobs that exist at the moment. So uh, if you look at what, what he's got here in terms of economic development, he's got the, the investment bank, which is really, really, really yeah. Major line of difference between here uh, and the rest of the UK, plus the the, the increase in, in infrastructure spending, and I have to say that the Scottish economy has performed better than the UK economy, apart from 2014 and thereafter when we had the blip with North Sea oil, which was a global thing, which we're just recovering from. But overall, the Scottish economy has has, has 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 outperformed because we have kept the infrastructure spending up and the construction industry going. Uh, initially, John Swinney did that by some wonderful financial jiggery pokery, which I'll tell you about another day. Um, but um, now the Scottish government has got some borrowing powers, he's borrowing that money and he's using it very wisely. When you're borrowing money to invest in infrastructure, it's not money you're, you know, you're throwing at the wall because you created an asset which grows the economy, which earns in interest for the economy. It's not PFI. No, it's definitely not. No, it's not PFI. Oh, right, well, don't get me into PFI. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, so uh, there, there are some hard nuggets here in, 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 in Derek's proposals for keeping the economic growth going despite Brexit. Yeah, and I mean obviously one of the, the, the things he mentioned was about the economy was about innovation and sustainability and when he talked about the city deals and the growth deals he was mentioning the length and breadth of Scotland and, it, and it's about what he appears to be saying is, is about um, you know, investing in all these areas to try and make things better. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing about City Deals is quite important to remember is um, uh, Labour Party commentators are harp on and on, we said this before, about, about the squeeze on local government spending. Um, but they then forget to add in uh, the money the Scottish Government is giving through the City Deals, mm. which also levers in money from the Treasury. So the, the actual squeeze on local authorities are bad isn't quite as much as sometimes Labour makes out. Um, but the city deals are very important because they, 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 they harness money from the Scottish Government and from Treasury, which is geared to um, skills, infrastructure, really nuts and bolts that will improve economic growth in local areas. Um, so very important, very important, very important. And I think what will happen um, from 2020, when we hope that the uh, National Investment Bank is up and running, that, that will take over. The, 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 the city deals are one-offs, but I think beyond that, that when that, you know 20, uh, 2020 and beyond, uh, when when um, the National Investment Bank kicks in, that will maintain this kind of flow of real resources into the local areas. And he talked about. Um the town centres um, and normally you know people for a while have been talking about oh the, the, the town centres the problems the rates the problems the rates are too high they're too high but actually what he seemed to be talking about was um, diversifying and developing yeah, yeah, town centres yeah. the reality is our town centres are not the same as they were before and they never will be and that is 
not down to local authorities or governments. This is a down to the way we behave now, the way we, we shop online and we do things differently. So I think that will be interesting to see what that kind of diversification yeah. will look like. Yeah. I mean, you can't ignore the crisis in the high street yeah. and retail. I mean, IKEA, IKEA's profits collapsed this year. I mean, mm. if IKEA can't make money, um, then who can? Um, so th there is an issue, and I, I, I actually, were one of the things I disagreed with having listened briefly to, I interviewed all small print, but I, I, I thought that Derek was wrong not to introduce the out-of-town levy mm. and use that money to, to help the high street. Uh, and I would have liked to have seen um, uh, the, the tourism tax brought in. Um, because I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a, uh, an easy way to earn some extra revenue. I think Derek's problem um, in the medium term uh, is how to find, with the economy in a weakened state from Brexit and beyond, is how do you find other sources of taxation to do the strategic things you want to do? And this gets us to the issue about the debate he's going to have to have with the Greens mm. on getting this budget passed. Because the Greens want some strategic change, major reform, in local government funding. And that gets you into the whole question of whether we should have some kind of land tax. Yeah. Which I do think, and I, and I think even if we could, even if, if we opened up the discussion in, in, a, in a serious way, because there is no other way. If we, there's something, I'll explain something very odd about Britain, whole of the UK. 51% of all the wealth in the United Kingdom, it's a rich, one of the richest countries in the world, 51% is tied up in land. Yeah. Now, that's not true of other countries. In the, if you take the G7 industrial countries, um, it's only about 37% um, of their wealth is in, is in land. Uh, Germany is in the 26%. Mm. So um, because of our skewed taxation system, the very rich have stuffed their money away in land. So if 51% of all the wealth in the UK is in land, why do we tax them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. And you, you touched on the Greens there, and for the last couple of days, there's been mutterings from the Greens and the Lib Dems that they wouldn't be, um, or they weren't committing to support the, the budget at this stage. What, what do you think the outcome's going to be? Do you think that? Well, I mean, it, it, it happens every year. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and the, the last few years, the Greens have, a deal has been done. So it, it's, it's par for the course, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Derek makes a, a proposal, then there's discussion, right? Um, and it's sad that, you know, the Lib Dems have decided to, to make the Constitution mm -hmm. an issue mm -hmm. in trying to pass the Scottish budget. Yeah. They say, oh, we won't deal with you unless you drop uh, 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 independence. I mean, it's just the gamesmanship. They don't want to deal, right? So um, I think, you know, a, a deal can be done with the Greens. And I think it's perfectly respectable for the Greens to say, well, we need some kind of permanent reform to local government funding. Everybody says that. The, the problem to date is that no one's been able to agree on what the alternative funding of local authorities should be. Well, time to get down to business. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because it's you know, obviously one of the, the big things is um, the ongoing issue around council tax and um, how should that change and what should it look like. And, and I mean, it was frozen for, what, nine years? Um, and then... People weren't happy when it wasn't frozen, yes. but they were they calling for it to be unfrozen. And it's that, you know, almost you can't win really, but there's got to be some way we, we re-look at things. But I think the, the nature of human beings is they don't like change. Well, exactly. It's always, always the most difficult thing to get agreement on what the new tax should be. It's, everyone, everyone agrees when the existing tax is rotten, but getting them around the table to agree on what we should replace it. And it's, I mean, we've been talking about local government funding for like decades so we'll see but if they I mean so the onus is now on the Greens if they you know if, if, if they want reform then they have to be willing to talk about concrete reform and compromise and decide on something mm -hmm. one last thing um, the, we, we haven't talked about income tax people out there you pay your income tax um, uh, Derek has, has frozen all of the um, uh, 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 the, the bans and rates now um there, there was a thought, and I wondered whether he would, you know, kind of raise the the band just a little mm -hmm. bit, because mm -hmm. what happens is if you know, um, if you if you freeze the rate, and remember there being the, the Hammond in order to win the middle class vote mm -hmm. and calm people down in England has has shifted the 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 the, um, the higher rate up to to fifty p. Um, if you if you freeze the rates and inflation comes along and more people get jobs and move up. Uh, the income ladder, then you actually you earn a bit more money. I don't think you'll earn a lot from freezing the rates. People, it's, it's a little bit of cash which allows them to do other things. 
And the um, question is, can you, how long can you go on freezing the rates? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I mean, I, I, I think it's probably the best thing to have done in the current circumstance. Yeah. Labour was pressuring, pressuring him to raise um, the, the top, the additional rate for people on 150 grand. Mm -hmm. But we've just discovered, we've discovered this year, um, there's only 13,000 of them. Mm -hmm. So it's a tiny number. So you can't raise very much money, even if you I mean, I have no moral or economic objection to raising uh, uh, the, the rate on, on a few, I wish I had 150,000 pounds. Um, um, but, so, uh, but there are not enough of them to raise enough money mm -hmm. to, to solve NHS it. education. So that's a kind of, just a silly point Labour mm -hmm. makes. Um, but uh, if on, 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 on basic rate and on the higher rate, if, you, if we freeze everything permanently, then gradually we'll end up in a situation where um, or quite ordinary folk, you know, teachers at the top of the band and, you know, and, and uh, doctors will, will, will start really being squeezed. So you can't, this is not, an, a lo, this is not a long term, even a medium term solution. But it's good. I mean, I, I think it's sensible for, for this year. We'll wait to see what happens with, with, with Brexit. Do you think um, in terms of that kind of taxation approach, are we are we kind of heading towards our Scandinavian neighbours whereby people there appear to appreciate that if you pay that wee bit more tax, then you get better services? It's like for, for so long, we almost have had this attitude of something for nothing, you know, Absolutely. I'm entitled to, I pay my council tax, I, you know, the litter needs to get picked, that type of thing. Whereas in actual fact, for just a small amount more money from everybody could have such a massive impact. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been driving, I mean, I don't know, this is turning into what drives George Kevin crazy, probably. <laughs> right, I mean, listening to, 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 to Murdo Fraser, the, the, the Tory financial spokesperson, I mean, in the run-up to this budget, he's been saying, we will spend more on the public services and we will cut your taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, come on, I mean, you have to be, I mean, I, he possibly believes it, which just might prove he can't do logic. Look at countries in Europe, Scandinavian countries, Germany, which have kind of levels of public service that you and I would think were desirable. They're spending, they're taking about 50, 55% of the national cake, national GDP in tax. In the UK, and Scotland's tied into this until we have enough shift and, and enough leeway, in the UK, it's about, I think, memory says 57, 8% of GDP covers public services. Now, so you have to say to folk, you don't have to have a decent health mm -hmm. service. Um, you don't have to have decent schools, but you want them. What we're spending is not enough to deliver what you want. Uh, and so I, I think we just have to be up front and tell people that. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you go vote on it. If you want to view, if you want to, if you want to do what the Tories want and have your taxes cut, you can have your taxes cut. You won't have the public services because what the Tories really want is to privatise the mm -hmm. law. And when it's privatised, and when you have to go to an American health company to pay for your your, your health, then you'll see what what prices really are. Yeah, yeah. So do you have any final thoughts on the the budget? I thought it was. George. I thought twenty-five minutes. I thought that was right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm used to. I'm used to these Westminster long things that go on for overnight. <laughs> um, I. I need to see the small print. I thought it was. It was robust. It was. It was workmanlike. Um, I think um, what was missing, as we said earlier, was um, what. What is it going to offer the Greens mm -hmm. to get this through? Uh, that. That. That's still an open question. So watch the space. Well, thank you for coming in, George, and, and sharing your um, expertise and insight. That's been um, really interesting. Thanks to you watching at home. I, thought, I hope you've all enjoyed um, our special report, um, which turned into budget plus a bit of Brexit. Um, and we look forward to your comments on Twitter. And we'll see you again on Sunday for the Full Scottish. <laughs>